Hi everyone, welcome back to Longevity Now, Longevity Now FL. Uh, I'm Luigi Fontana, professor of medicine and the scientific director of the Charles Perkins Center RPA Clinic of the University of Sydney. Today we are diving into some exciting new research from Nature Medicine that sheds light on the gut microbiota and its role in uh, uh, promoting inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD in short. IBD, which includes Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, affect approximately 7 million people worldwide. And while it is used to be much more common in Western countries, uh, recently newly uh, uh, industrialized nations have seen a sharp increase in cases over recent decades. So, what's the driving to this global surge? Well, turns out our gut bacteria might play a much bigger role than we thought. And we're going to discuss about it in this short video. Now, the team behind this nature medicine study analyzed the data of, all, 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 uh, of nearly 6,000 stool samples across multiple countries. So this is the strength of this paper. Looking for differences in the gut microbiome between people with and without IBD. And what they found was really fascinating. First of all, they confirmed that people with IBD have higher prevalence of certain pro-inflammatory bacteria uh, like the adherent invasive Escherichia coli, Proteus mirabilis, Klebsiella pneumonia, and the toxigenic Bacteroides frag fragilis. While they had a reduction in beneficial species like the Fecalibacterium uh, prausnitzi. In particular, in this paper, they found that adherent invasive Escherichia coli was present in over half, yes, half of uh, patients with chronic disease, with Crohn, with Crohn disease, and this uh, uh, basically bacteria, this uh, invasive uh, Escherichia coli has been associated with uh, mucosal dysbiosis, functional changes in the gut microbiota, and disease recurrence after surgery. They also found that Bacteroides fragilis, through the production of toxins, may further contribute to intestinal inflammation, exacerbating the disease. Now, one of the novelty of this paper is that the researchers were able to develop a new diagnostic tool using metagenomic data which analyzes specific bacteria to accurately distinguish between Crohn disease and ulcerative colitis. Their model, the models they created, had a area under the curve for detection of over 0.9, meaning they are incredible accurate. This new diagnostic test, called a multiplex droplet digital PCR outperform current mod methods like the fecal calproctectin, uh, a common marker used to detect inflammation. Not only this test is more accurate, but it's also non-invasive, meaning that potentially in the near future it could change how we diagnose IBD. The study also identified some unexpected players in the IBD gut ecosystem. They found a new oral bacterium called uh, Actinomyces sp oral taxon 181 uh, that was enriched in both Crohn's and uh, UC patients. This bacteria probably migrate from the mouth to the gut, triggering inflammation. We don't know how, and uh, we need to do more studies about it. 
And uh, in patients with uh, active ulcerative colitis, the researchers found also more of a bacterium called uh, Gemella morbillorum, uh, which could uh, be uh, an important contributor to the uh, reassemblance, to the, to the recurrence of uh, IBD. What's even more intriguing, and now we are talking about, you know, the dietary uh, uh, role uh, in shaping the risk of IBD, uh, is that uh, these data, this, the functional data, suggest that uh, diet plays a major role. We know that a major shift towards highly processed food and increase animal-based products and reduce consumption of minimally, minimally processed plant-based food rich in fiber is believed to play, play a crucial role in the pathogenesis of this inflammatory bowel disease. Indeed, the dietary transition has led to the depletion of key gut bacteria species with anti-inflammatory properties diminishing the ability of the gut to ferment dietary fiber and produce short-chain fatty acids, which are vital for maintaining a healthy intestinal mucosal barrier. The loss of these bacteria contributes to impaired immune regulation and increased intestinal inflammation, which are hallmark, hallmark features of IBD. Beyond Microbial imbalances, the study revealed that several bacterial species depleted in IBD patients are key contributors to the amino acid biosynthesis pathway. Impairments in these pathways could have profound implications for intestinal tissue repair and immune regulation, potentially exacerbating the chronic inflammation seen, seen in IBD. A deficiencies in these bacteria and their associated metabolic function may hinder the gut's ability to maintain homeostasis, ultimately contributing to disease progression. So, to recap, this new research from Nature Medicine has given us a much clearer picture of how gut microbiota changes in IBD. It's, it is not just about what bacteria are present, but also about how they impact our immune system, intestinal function, and even disease progression. The rise of ultra-processed foods and animal food products and the decline in plant-based diet rich in fibers are likely a major contributing factor to the erosion of beneficial gut bacteria. Basically, what we are eating is shaping and destroying, depleting the beneficial bacteria from our gut and the gut of our children, thereby increasing uh, the, the risk of intestinal inflammation and impaired mucosal barrier function. These findings open new avenues for the development of micro microbiota-based diagnostic tools and therapies which could change the management of IBD by focusing on restoring gut microbial balance and metabolic function. So, thank you for watching. Uh, and uh, as always, this is uh, Longevity Now, Longevity Now FL, the channel of health and longevity and well being. Uh, I'm Luigi Fontana, professor of medicine, uh, the scientific director of the Charles Perkins Center RPA Clinic uh, and the Health for Life program of the University of Sydney and a clinical academic in the Department of Endocrinology of the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney. Thank you for listening.